Hi everyone, thank you for coming for Python programming. Um, so today uh, we'll, we'll have some advanced topics, all right? Uh, for each of the advanced topics, I put some codes for you that you could by yourself learn uh, and practice. Um, I create my PowerPoint presentation, so um, if you like what I put here, you could use, or Google. Google, you could find tens of websites who explain things maybe in a better way, all right? As long as you understand what you are doing. So we're gonna start about iterators and generators. Last time we started with iterators, we spoke about iterators, remember? Okay, so what is iterator? Huh? So for example, when I say, for example, for T, N, for example, um, one, two, three, four. Print I. So what what is this? Why I'm able to do that? Because this is an I triple. Okay, list, tuples, these are I they're I triple containers. Right? But they are not I triple uh, I triple I uh, no, say the word I triple uh, by themselves, okay? The Python created them by creating two functions. The first one is iter, and the second one is next. Okay? If you followed the last lecture, you understand what I'm talking to. So, is the list iterable? Yes. Tubo? Yes. String? Yes. Many, 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 many of the containers are. But what if you are creating your own class and you would like to make it iterable? Easy, you could do that, okay? You could do that. So for example, if you create a class, for example, a class A. Okay, which has, for example, first name, okay, and last name, for example. And you need to make the objects you create of the class A iterable. All you have to create in the body of the class two functions, which is iter and next. And by the way, we explained that last week, but we'll, we'll go over it uh, today. All right, <coughs> so iterators are everywhere in Python. They are used in for loops. So why we are able to do the for loop? Because it's iter, okay? And any object, okay, could be iterable. And the iterator by itself is an object. So when you create I, I, iterator, what you are creating? An object. An object. All right. So to be able to do that, you have to create two functions, iter and next. When you see functions this format, underscore, underscore, iter, underscore, underscore, what does it mean? One person speak up. It's what? Private? I'm not going to jump from the window now, let me wait. It's construction. Huh? It's what? Construction. It's not a constructor. Constructor, it, it's what? In, in it. That means it's a function inherited from object. All right? So remember, any class is inherited from where? From object. So all the methods there will be inherited to the subject classes, right? These are defined in where? In the object. If you're creating your own class and you redefine them again, so what you are doing? Over, overloading, you are overloading the functions. You are overloading the functions, right? So iter function basically is this function. And next, okay. so the best thing is always go to the example, example, right? All right. So my list, it has what is this? Speak to me. Integers. List of it's an uh, it's a list of integers. Is list iterable? Yes. 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 So if I say iter my list, so what I'm doing now? I'm trying what? Iterator. So what is this? Is an object. Object of what? Of iter. Okay? 
Then what I could do, once it's I triple, what does it mean when I triple? When I, when I created an I triple, what did I get? So I have a memory space, for example, this is a memory space, right? Okay, so I have four, I have seven, zero, three. So the pointer points to where? At the beginning. Whenever I execute next, where is it gonna move? To the next element, next, next element. That's what iteration, okay? So when I create iterator, that means kind of I'm creating a pointer to the location of the first element. What is the first element? Four. When I do next, when I execute, for example, next, this will move where? Here. I execute it again, gonna go move to where? Here, and so on and so forth. So in here I created my iter. So if I do type my iter, what will it give me? Object of iterator, right? So in here, when I say, for example, next, my iter, it will print what? The first element, which is? Four. If I execute it again, next, my item will print seven. When I say next, for example, okay, um, okay, my item dot underscore next, because this is exactly like next. Okay, all right, what will it give me? Three, the next uh, uh, element, right? The last one, zero. Uh, zero, then three. Now, if I do it again, what will it give me? An error, why? Because I am out of stop iteration, because I am out of the range, out of the range. So that's what's iterator, okay, iterator. Can I do it for a class of boxes? Let's say I have a class of boxes. Box, right? Yeah. All right? So I could create iterators. Uh, could I, can I make this, cl this class iterator? Yes. All I have to add two functions. I have to overload two functions. What are the two functions? Iter and next. All right, that's a simple, okay? So we use the next function to manually iterate through all the items of the iterator. When we reach the end and there is no more data, then it's, it has to be a stop. Okay, so that's why we are able to for loop in many iterators, okay? If I'm creating a new class, class of boxes, if I use for loop like in here, will it work? No, because I don't have iterator, I have to create first. Let's take a look at this example. So for element in iterable, you will be able to iterate, right? So the way it's done, look how for is written. For actually in design it's what? A while loop, a while loop. So what you did, okay, this, the, the iterable, you create iterable with it, so you'll have iter object. Then, while it's true, keep looping forever, try element, and what you're doing, next iter job, you're going to the next element in the iterator, you do whatever, something, whatever, and then at, at the end of the loop, when you come, at the end of the list, okay, when it comes to the end, it, it will give you a stop iteration and then a breakout. So basically, any loop, any for loop, is built like this with a while. Okay. Now I we going deep. We're looking at the architecture. That's why I call it advanced topics, right? Maybe you don't care. I mean, you could use this for T and this list, print I, whatever. Okay, but. You know, sometimes you need to understand the architecture. Clear so far? All right. All right, so building an iterator from scratch is easy in Python. We just have to implement this function and this function. That means we have to overload them, okay? The iter method returns the iterator object. So all of it returns the iterator object, okay? It's required. Some initialization can be performed. The next will make make you go through the iteration. Let's, tra uh, let's take this example. This example, what does it do? Power of two. Power of two. So I, there is a class called power of two. Okay, what does it mean power of two? Two power of one, two. Two power of two, four. Two power of three, eight, and so on forth. That's what does it, okay? 
this is a class I'm creating. So is it iterable by itself? It's not. So what does it do? First, first of all, we initialize. We do the initialization. So I have the max. What is the max? Okay. What is the max? So we start from two zero. to the power one. Okay. So at the beginning zero. That's what we're gonna right. So that's the initial. So this is the initial. There is one element, one attribute called max, which is defaulted to zero. Clear. Then we have the item and we have the next. To make this a class what? Iterable. To make it iterator, right? So I have to implement two functions. What are the functions? Talk to me. Iter and next. So in the iter, okay, in the iter I have element self n equals to zero and return self. That's fine. In here what I'm doing, if n less than the max, less than the max, okay, then what I do, I power it to that value, and then I increase n, okay, so let's take a look at the execution, a, what is a, object of power 2, what did they put, 4, so 4, that means the maximum, initial max was 0, I decided to make it 4, that means how many elements I have in this queue or this list? Four. Four, right? Yeah. Okay. Four. It starts from where? Zero. From zero. One, two, three. Actually, five. Five. Five, right? Good. Less or equal in here, right? So then I'm creating the iterator. Okay, iterator of A, object A, and I'm saving it in I. So when I say next i, will give me what? One. One. Next i again, give me two. Where is two is coming from? Because we increase it in here, the n, so it will be two to power two, or two to power one. Two to power zero, two to power one. Then it will be increased two to power two, four, two to power three, eight, two to power four, sixteen. If I do next one more time, it will be what? Yeah. Error. Why? Because out of the range, out of the range, all right? So in here, what I did, I have a class. Class I'm creating, what does it do? Calculating the power of two up to the maximum value. Is it by default iterable? No. no. I made it. How did I make it? I have to add two methods. What are iter and next? Okay? This is a pretty standard. This is that's the logic, what you're going to do with it. Okay? If you're creating a class of boxes, can you make it iterable? Yes. Yes. If you're creating a class of countries, can you make it iterable? Yes. yes. If you're creating a class of tables, yes. Class of cameras, yes. Class of people, yes. You could make it iterable. Okay? That you could iterate. So to think about iterable, you're making it behave like a list, for example. Right? Behave like a list. So you need to try it. I mean, if you are confused, once you try it, you'll understand it more. All right. Iterator's done. All right? Basically, you know, basically you should. You should, for every class you create, you make it iterable. If there is a need. Is it tough to do it? No. What you have to have? Two methods. You have to overload two methods. And you have to play with the logic what you are doing inside them. Clear? Let's go to generators. So, and you know what are generators in Python? So basically we explained before about iterators. You need to have the iter function or method. You have the next function and you have to have the stop iteration when you go there. So this process is very lengthy to create, right? You have to write two functions. Two minutes ago, ago I was saying it's very easy, just you have to create two methods, overload two methods. Now I'm telling you that's too much. Why is too much? Because generator is much more easier still. It's much more easier, okay? So um, this is a lengthy and counterintuitive. Generators come into rescue in such situations. So Python, genera Python generators are a simple way of creating iterators. So what we are doing with the generators, 
we are creating I three to the stem. All right. So, okay. Simply speaking, a generator is a function that returns an object. What is a generator? What is a generator? Talk to me. Always talk to me. What is a generator? It's a function. So, what we are defining in here? A function. A special kind of function. What it is? A generator. Okay. 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 So, let's take a look in here. All right. So, what makes this function as a generator? One thing. Very simple. We use something called yield. Yield, not return. You could use return also inside it, but it have a yield. You know what's yield do? What what does yield do? Return in a function. What does it do? Return a value, right? Yeah. And what does yield do? Okay, let me repeat that question. When I ask a wrong question, I expect wrong wrong answer, right? <laughs> All right. Return. What does it do? Return a value and and is the execution of the function. Okay, underscore, underscore, in the execution of the function. Yield, what does it do? It returns a value, but it pauses the function. It does not end it. So it's gonna go back to the caller of the function. And when you come back to the function, it will remember everything. Okay, it will be clear with the example but remember all the variables. So in return, we end the execution of the function. In yield, in yield what we do? Pause. We pause. We pause. All right, so again, it is fairly simple to create a generator in Python. It is an easy as, uh, as defining a normal function with yield statement. So when you see any function, that it's what? Generator. Generator, okay? A function containing at least one yield statement, it may contain more than that, it becomes a generator. Okay. It will pose the function. So let's go in here. Okay. Okay. Local variables and their states are remembered. So when you pause, when you go out and you come again, you start from the step where you started. All right? So for example, in a function, in any function, okay, in here for example, when you have a def function, for example, def fun function, whatever, you know, um, you know, okay, so when I say, uh, you know, x, x plus 5, it x equals x plus 5, for example, return x. All right, when I call a function, and let's say I pass, let's, let's call func 5. So, I'm passing 5. x will be how much? 5 plus 5 is return? 10. 10. Okay, if I call it again, func, okay, 10, what will happen? 10, 10 plus 5, 15, return 15, right? So, it does not remember anything. Right? Okay? So let's say that I don't pass anything in here. Okay? And let's say I say x equals 5 in here. Okay? And I don't use return. I say yield. Yield x. So when I call it the first time, okay? When I call it the first time, okay? What, what, will, what will do? x equals 5. Then x equals 5 plus 5, 10. And it will return what? 10. It will return 10. It will return 10. And I'm going to go from there to here. Then I'm calling it again. OK? I'm calling it again, right? All right. So uh, let me move x here. Whatever. I mean, I mean, let's say x, whatever. Let's say x defined outside, whatever. So now, when you go to x, how much is x for the second time? 10. Plus 5, 15. If I call it for the third time, it will be 20. So it does not forget. It poses the function. Poses the 
function. It causes the function. So let's take an example. Maybe I have a good example here. Yeah, let's take an example here. So a simple generator function, right? So I'm calling it my generator. N equals one. So print this is printed first. Okay, yield n. All right, so that's the function. What does the function do? It has a variable equals, which is a, a n equals to one, and will print a sentence. That's all. It has n equals one and it prints a sentence. Right. So let me start from here, right? So in here, n equals your incre increment n, okay? And increment n, then a print, this is the printed second and yield n, all right. So what will happen in here, what will happen, okay? And then again increment it and print for the fifth yield n. So look in here what I did. I created an object of A, an object in my generator, I, I saved it as an object. Then I said next A, what it will print? It's gonna go to here. N equals one, print the first, print the first, and it will return one. So where it paused, where it does it stop? Here, right? Now it's gonna go out to where? To the caller. Then what I executed, then next A. It's gonna continue from here. It remember where to stop, continue from here. What I did, increment for N, then a print, this is a printed second, and yield n, printed two. Now when I go next again, it will remember to, co to continue from here, and so on and so forth. All right? So a generator has at least how many yield statement? One. One, two, three, four. So every time we execute it, it will go back, if every time we call it, it will go back to where it stopped, and does not reinitialize or rechange the values of the variables there, the local variables. Clear? Clear? So what I did in here, I created what? Iterator, what called the generator. So iterator and generator kind of doing the same thing, kind of, okay? In the iterator, I have to create two methods. The first one is? I turn and the second one, yes. next. In here, I just have to use the yield statement, right? So which one do you think is better? Okay. Uh, so look at this, huh? Generator. Generator, for three reasons. We're going to talk about them quickly. So in here, look at in here. Okay. Uh, so normally generator functions are implemented with loop having a suitable terminating condition. Okay. So for example, in here, we, I need to reverse a text. Reverse a text. Hello, it will be written O-L-L, -L, you know, E-H, right? So let's take a look at this function. So I'm going to pass a string. I am going to get the length of the string and save it in length, right? There is a function called length will give you for i in range length, so hello, how many how many how many letters has? What's the length of hello? Four. Four or five? Okay, whatever you like. Five. Okay, and we're gonna go reverse. So five minus one, then up to four, and from the last one, and we're gonna step by step, right? That's why it prints O reverse, right? Okay, so four character in in reverse string hello so i need to reverse the string hello i'm printing the character so let's pass it let's excuse this for character and reverse string so what's the reverse string hello you get a pass here hello so what's the length five for i range five minus one four so it will be a four minus one minus one so it will print you know uh, character uh, four first okay which is o three two, one, zero, and it works, right? So what is this? Generator. Generator. So every time in the for loop is called in here, it will come to the, t 
to the to where to start. So how many yields in this program? Okay, four or five. Like five, actually. Because if I enter hello five, and I have five. So the, how, depends on the length, right? Okay? So the length of the characters. So every time it executes, it's going to go to the to that row. Okay? So this is what a generator, which is kind of L. Okay. Anyways, I'm not sure if they, so it's a very memory efficient, I mean, maybe there is something in here. So Python generator expression, okay. So, so you, you know what's a list expression, right? Or comprehension, list comprehension, right? So for example, we could say for, for I and a list. Right, what is this? List comprehension. List comprehension, right? We also could have something called Python generator expression. All right. So look in here, for example. My list, I'm initializing it to a list. It has how many elements? Four integers, right? All right. So in here, when I say, for example, x squared for x in my list. What does it do? I'm gonna go to the one, substitute it, and square it, and we'll give you what? One squared, right? One squared, then three squared, then six squared, then 10 squared. So what would be the output? One, nine, thirty-six hundred. What we call this? List comprehension. You see, Python is easy. You don't have even to create a tough loop. Okay, they create like a shortcut called comprehension. Right? So, x square for x in my list. What is my list? It will be substituted in here. How many elements? Four. That means how many, how long, how many times you get a loop? Four times. Every time you loop, what do you do? You square x. Right? Very easy, right? Okay, so for the list comprehension, we put it inside what? Square brackets. If I remove the square brackets and I put round brackets, what we call it? We call it generator expression. It has nothing with a tuple, okay? So in here, in here, what is this? This is a list. No, this is not a list. This is a list comprehension. What is this? List. What is this? List comprehension. That means it's a function. Okay, what is this? Is it a tuple? No. It's what? A generator expression. So in here what we are doing, the same thing. Same thing can be done using generator expression. All right? Same thing can be done with generator expression. So we can see above that the generator expression did not produce the required result immediately. And instead, it returned a generator object. Okay, so what is the output of this here? One, nine. The output of this, another list, which is one, nine, thirty-six hundred. What is the output of this? Iterator or a generator. The output will be a generator object. How can I read the values with next? Right? So so what you do in here, okay, so so it, it will give you a generator, okay, you could save it somewhere, and then you next it. So every time you do next, you read one value. So the first time you run next, so in here, for example, if I did if I did for this one, in here, we'll focus on this. So if I say, for example, g equals x two for x in my list. So what is g? 
generator. If I execute g dot next, what it will give me? If I say again g dot next again, what it will give me? None. If I do it again, it will give me what? So, the list comprehension, the output will be a list. Generator expression, the output will be generator object. To be able to read the data, I have to do what next? Yes. Uh, so, when we execute j is equals to x to the power 2, so is the list created when we execute that statement or when we execute g dot next? It will be created g dot text. Okay, and that's one of the advantage of generator. It does not, let's say this list has a million records, million elements. If I use if I use list comprehension, how many memory spaces do I need? A million. If I use generator expression, how much memory do I need? None. I need a place for the generator. So every time I do next, it will create it on the fly. So it's a very memory efficient. All right? Of course, for writing a small programs, does not matter a lot for you. But think about like you doing machine learning and deep learning with millions of records, tens of millions of values. All right? So how much memory are you going to need? to create a list, okay? So that's why generator comes and the efficient. Actually, when you have a limited resources, the only way you could run your program by using these techniques, because you don't have, if, if your laptop is have eight gig of memory and you're having like, like millions of records, your memory will not handle it. So you have to, you know, think about the advanced ways of doing it. Okay, it will be generated on the, on the fly. All right, look in here, for example, you have my list, it has four values. Then A equals whatever, okay, so what is this in here? Is it less comprehension? No, it's what? Generator expression, all right? So the way you could get it, next A will give you 9, next A, 36, and so on and so forth. So it will, will create a memory space when you, you next it, right? It will be created on the fly. That's why it's a very efficient. Just take a look and check it out. So in here, for example, e, why generators are used in Python? Number one, because it's easy to implement. In here, we created iterator. So you see how much code we have to create for iterator? And here we created what? A generator with a yield, right? So it's much more easier to write. So whenever you could use generator, don't use iterator, okay? If it's applicable for you. The second reason is a memory efficient. So it reduces one at a time. So the values will be reduced at one at a time, all right? The third reason is it represents infinite stream, infinite stream. So usually for, you know, if you have a fixed list, you could use list comprehension. But what if you have infinite list? Can you have infinite list? Yes. For example, even numbers. Where does it end, even numbers? It does not end. So can you use a normal list? You can't. Because you know you start from 2, 4, 6, 8. But it's an infinite list. How can you represent infinite? All right? Use generator. Because you have the beginning, but you don't have the end. Look at this simple code in here. OK, all even. So you start from 0. Presuming 0 is an even, right? Y true, yield, end, return end. Then what you do? Add 2. So the first time you do next, what will it print for you? 
Zero. Second time. Two. Third time. Four. Six. Is there an end? There is no end. So when you have an application that you the list does not have an end, what do you do? Use generator. Okay? If you have an application that the, 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 the data is like in millions and in hundreds of millions, you don't have enough memory in your computer. You don't want to create them on one time. You need to create them in the fly. Use it and then truncate, right? So use generators. So generators is like a very way, a very good way to write efficient programs, especially when you're dealing with machine learning, deep learning, these things that need a lot of, of data. Okay, they are simpler and easier than iterators. iterators. Okay, all right, clear so far. All right, and also it will give you a pipeline generator. So take example. I don't have time for that. Okay, all right. So are we friends now with uh, generators and iterators? Okay, do we feel the love with these two techniques? All right, you fall in love with them. Who did not? The answer is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so so I will assume one or two did not fall in love with the generators. So I'll ask this a question. How many of you did not fall in love with generators? Right? Then everybody is yes, right? All right. So if you know how to use it, then once you try it and you know you know and you know become perfect in using it, you'll find yourself using it. Remember that when you go for a job interview. Okay, when they ask you a task to write, right? So you could write the code like, you know, let's say you could write the code in 100 lines, but there is a way to write it in 10 lines. Okay, and the person interviewing you is the expert, right? So it should be your goal to write an efficient code. Efficient code, right? As I told you, that many, many things when you write programs you don't care about, like the documentation docs, like you know, uh, like uh, trying to write simple code, uh, using already like functions, uh, functions better than functions. Like for example, for processing, for example, if you're dealing with matrices, okay, you could use lists, lists of lists. But when you're dealing with the big matrices, don't use lists of lists because it's very slow. What are you gonna use? You're gonna use NumPy, for example, arrays, right? So this will show the interviewer, the person interviewing you, how much you know and how much talent in you. So it's not anymore that you write a working fun, a working application, a working program. You're writing an efficient program. It's about writing an efficient program. Okay? And once you learn to do that in Python, it will be easier, it will be very easy to do it in Java, in C sharp, in different languages. Because Writing efficient code becoming your norm, your habit, your obsession, your obsession. All right? How you can how can you have this obsession? By doing it in every code you write. All right? You write a code without a try statement. Okay? So for example, you know, in, in errors. Okay? Uh, when you're having an, uh, you know, if your code, for example having like uh, x plus 3. It's a simple code, there is no problem, right? Okay, is there a possibility for error in here? There is no error, there's no possibility for error. But if your code has x, okay, x, okay, divided by 3, okay, or 3 plus x and 3 divided by x. Is there a possibility of having a code in here? Yes, you could have runtime error. If the user enter x or somehow the x becomes zero, what you'll have? Division by zero, all right? So this code, it must be inside try accept. If you write such a code without a try and accept, because it's clear that you could have an error there, you are not a good programmer. All right? You have to watch for the runtime errors. So any code you write, you have to use assert, you have to use uh, try accept, you have to use all of these things. 
It's become, it should be ha your habit. Any code you write, simple code, always include these things. Documentation. Don't be like me and here, write like X and Y. There's nothing, nothing valuable called X and Y. Except, you know, for small things. But every variable has to have a full name, meaningful name. When you read a code for some good professional, you feel that you're reading a story. Go from the up, up, down, you don't get lost at all. It's every variable, every function, every class has a meaning. They write a full name, right? right? So it's a habit, okay? I encourage you to do that. All right. All right, so, oh, and here we're gonna talk about args and keyword arguments. Arguments and keyword arguments. And this is, we use it for what? For variable parameters. So usually when you have a function, for example, func, okay? You could have a fixed, for example, x, y, z, right? X parameters. What if this function could receive a variable amount of parameters? Not a fixed. Can we do that? Yes. We can do that easily, actually. So in here, for example, the syntax is to use the symbol, whatever asterisk, to take variable number of arguments. All right? So we could read that. Yeah, let's take up uh, this program here. So for example, Python program to illustrate so you have a variable number of arguments for variable number of arguments. So for example, you this function, I call it my function, and I'm passing to it arguments. How many arguments? How many arguments? How many arguments? Uh, apparently it's one, but it's not Th more. This is what does it mean? Zero or more? Zero or more. It does not necessarily to be one. It could be zero or more, right? So for arguments and the argument value. So in this in here, print the argument. So if I say my function, okay, and I'm passing hello, welcome to geeks for geeks. How many arguments I passed in here? Four. Okay, it will print for me. Four. If I pass five, five. If I pass zero, zero. So this is a very useful for functions that you don't know exactly how many parameters you're gonna have. Right. Also, look in here. Okay, um, uh, Python program to illustrate with first extra argument. So if I need to make sure one argument, very simple. So de de define my function, argument one, and then comma, variable number of arguments. So what is the minimum number of arguments they have to have? For this function, what is the minimum number of arguments they have to have? One, because I, I already have one. But this is could be zero or more. So if it's zero, it stays one. If it's one, it becomes two, and so on and so forth, right? Right? If I have a variable that I have to have minimum two, so I have to say argument one, argument two, then a variable number of arguments, right? So print first argument is argument one, and for argument, I looping it through the other argument. So what I did in here, my fun, hello, welcome to. So how many it will print? It will print the same, the same thing in here, right? The form, all right? So this is a very handy if I would like to have. Okay, so keywords, it's like a dictionary. So this is kind of a list. A list, you pass a list, okay? In here, you, you're passing a, a dictionary, a dictionary. So let's take a look at the example. All right, so in here, my function, and what I'm passing, two asterisks in here. So keywords, okay, for key and value, so this one is a keyword. The dictionary has a key and a value, and the, here the same thing. So look at the execution in here. So my fun first, first equals geeks. Mid equals for, last equals geeks. So first is what? The key, geeks is? the value, same applies. So in here, what I'm doing in here, for the key words dot item, it will return the key and the value, and then I'm printing the key and the value. So when I execute this, it will permit last equals geek, mid equals four, first equals geeks. What are these? 
keys. What are these values? So what we're trying to say in here that we could pass to the function variable number of parameters. Okay? In a form of a list or it could be in a form of dictionary. This is like a dictionary, right? A form in dictionary, right? Very nice, very nice, right? I said very nice. Okay, same thing in here, for example. In here, the same thing. So I'm passing what? At least how many variable? How many parameter? One. And this could be zero or more. So I first, what about? So in here is a parameter. In here is a dictionary. Here a dictionary kind of dictionary item. All right? Yes. Why is it in the reverse Why what? Is it in the reverse order and the last? Oh, yeah. So it does not guarantee. That's one thing. It does not guarantee like a dictionary. Even when you deal with the with the dictionaries, when you try to build the dictionary, there is no guarantee that you'll have it in order. Always. This is the nature of dictionary. Okay? So, you know, it will not be, but you know, but last will be geeks, mid will be four, first will be geeks, for example. Okay, it will be the right key and value combination, but there's no, not necessarily to be in the order. Okay? That's how it is. Can I combine these two together, the arguments and the keywords? Sure, I can. So in here, for example, I'm defining a function that has three arguments. That's normal way, order, old way. Other way I could do in here, okay, what I'm doing in here, my function, I'm passing like, you know, um, uh, uh, arguments, okay, uh, or keywords. So I could have a keywords or a, so in here, basically what I'm passing in here, what I'm creating in here. A dictionary. So imagine the dictionary here, right? And here what I'm trying to hear, tuple. Tuple, not a list, tuple. I say the list is a tuple, okay? And I'm passing it as a number. Okay? So what we have learned from here, that we could, uh, we could, you know, have variable parameters. Okay? You could use it as a tuple or you could bash it as dictionary. Clear? There are functions for that. Yes, there's many, many functions for that. Okay? Many functions for that. Right? If you have a function, enter the name of your children. If I execute this myself, how many uh, how many how many arguments are you need to have? Three. You have three children, right? Yourself? Zero maybe, right? Okay, somebody else could be have five children, right? Right? How many cars, for example? How many cars? Enter how many cars. So it's everybody's value you run it. Myself, I have two cars. Yourself have one car. Ten cars. Ten. Okay? You know, whatever, right? So there is a function for that, right? And this becomes very powerful. When you write the code, knowing them and trying them, it will make it a very powerful. Okay. We're going to come to Python closures. Anybody heard, heard about Python closures? No? Okay, so uh, okay, so Python closures are function calling a function within the function. Make sense? Okay, so so non-local variable in a nested function. It's nested functions. So you have a function, and inside the function you are defining another function. It's not calling, you are defining, and then call it. What we call this? Closure. Closure. All right? So before getting into what is a closure, we have first to understand what nested function and non-local variable is. A function defined inside another function is called a nested function. You have a function. Inside the function, you define another function. It's not that you called another function. You define another function. Nested functions can access variables on the enclosing scope. So the nested function, I mean, if you define like variables outside of the nested function, it will be able to see it. 
We'll see an example in a second, right? In Python, these non-local variables are read-only by default, and we must declare them, you know, as non-local using non-local keyword in order to modify them. So, if I have a function, if I, let me, and here, if I have a function, okay, def function a, okay, whatever x equals one, okay, x equals one. Then I'm defining another function inside def b print, for example, x. So the inner function will be able to see the variables in the enclosing function. But how it say how how does it see it? As read read only. It can read it, can modify it. If I need to modify it, I have to declare it as non-local. I have to say it's not local, for example, key method. Clear? Clear? That's what we understand what's nested function. Everybody Okay? Let's go to example of nested function. So in here, print message. Then inside the print message, I put the printer. I created a new function called printer. So print the message. So this message coming from where? Okay, so what I'm doing, what I'm doing is this function. I'm defining a function and I'm calling it outer function. I'm defining inner function and I'm calling it. So when I say print message, hello. Okay, what does it do? You're gonna go in here. This message would be hello. You're gonna go in here, printer. Okay, printer will call this printer. And we'll print the message. Where the message came from? From the outer function. We'll be able to read all the variables in the outer function. Symbol. What we call this? What we call it? Nested functions. Not the closure. Nested functions. Symbol, right? So that's what the, that's what the example for now. What we call this message, what we call this message in here? Variable, but what kind of variable? Non-local variable, non-local variable. I did, did I declare inside this function, did I declare message? I did not. Where I got the message from? From the outer. So it's not local, kind of global, kind of from outside. Clear? So defining closure function. So look in here, so in here print, message this is the outer enclosing function printer where I print the message this message is gonna come from where from outside and then here what I'm returning returning printer okay it's a little bit different and then here this is I'm calling the printer in here I'm return a printer return the function so then okay return the function all right so now let's try calling this function okay so when I say print message hello it will print and, and I'm gonna save it where in another so another what does it have now what is another a function it's a function it's an object of function all right if I execute another it become a function if I execute it what will give me hello so this will give me hello and this will give me Hello. That's what is that's what is enclosure. So I have created a function from a function. Okay, I have created a function from a function. So even if I go delete this function, this will still work. So in here, what I did, delete the print message, and I, I, I mean, this another created from where? Another created from from where? From the function, original right. function. Okay, even if I delete, delete the original function, the newer function will continue to work. It's exactly the crocodile, when you cut its head, the tail is still moving and waving. Okay, so we, call, we killed the original function, but the copy function is still working. Still in code, okay, it's working, all right? So when I delete it, now when I execute the print message, 
who has deleted this is not going to work. You understand what's enclosure? So the first thing you have to understand what is nested functions, how it works, then you'll be able to understand closures. So this is comes handy when you're trying to work with a function outside the scope. What time is it? 2.40. 2.40. 2.40, is it a break time? Yeah. yeah, let me see if this is done. So when do we have to use a closure? Okay, so the, the criteria that must be met to create a closure, number one, we must have nested function, function inside a function. That's number one. Number two, the nested function must refer to a value defined in the enclosing, fu enclosing function. All right? And number three, the enclosing function must return the nested function. That's what make a closure. That's what make a closure. So these conditions are here. So let's take a look. You, we must have a nested function. Do we have a nested function? Yes, this is a nested function. Okay. Condition number two, the nested function must refer to a value defined in, do we have it? Yes, message is in the closing and it's referred into the nested. Okay, third, the enclosing function must return the nested function. Yes. Return, okay, that will make a closure. Three things make a closure. Two things does not make a closure. Make something unknown, you could name it, all right? That's a, a closure, right? If you return multiple functions. <laughs> no, you could call it anything. When to use a closure, okay? It's good for data hiding. It could, it could be a substitute for smaller classes. Instead of creating a smaller class, you could create a closure, all right? Myself, myself, I don't prefer to use closures. Whenever I need to create a class, I create a class. But this is like kind of a small okay, uh, thing you could use. You could take a look at that. There's no time to cover that. So let's have a break. Only five minutes. All right. So we continue with Python decorators. All right. Well, Python seems like have a lot of things, you know, interesting things. So decorator to add functional to the existing code. So we're trying to add a functional to existing code. So this is also called uh, meta programming as a part of the program uh, tries to modify another part of the program at compile time. All right. So for example, uh, in here, let's take a look in here. So this is, this is a function. First, you pass a message, you print the message, all right? And when I, when I say first hello, we'll print hello. Second, so first, I'll assign it to the second. Second hello, it will print. So second will become equal to what? To the first, okay? It's kind of one function, have different names, right? All right. Okay, look in here, for example. In here, increment. It will increment the input to the parameter. In here, decrement, will decrement the parameter, all right? So increment x in here, and here decrement, right? Okay, so let's create another function called operate. And you're gonna pass to it what? A function and element. So I say function of x, and uh, the result will be a function, okay, function of x. So what will the function will be? Uh, we don't know. Okay, the operate, the operate, operate function. Okay, get a pass a function of return. That is it. So in here, for example, Okay, in here, yeah, we don't know. So in here, what I'm, I'm passing a function and I'm passing a value. So what does it do? We'll execute the function passed on x. So for example, operate increment three. So which one is gonna call? The increment. In here, it will call the decrement. Okay, decrement, 
right? So we could pass, we could pass a function to a function. A function to a function. Okay. Okay. In here, also, let's what we do in here. We define is called, is called, so, and we define a function inside the function. Is returned, print hello, and return is returned. So we have a function defined inside the function. All right, I'm creating a new function, I'm calling is called. So is called will be saved in new. When I say new, new, okay, it will, the new will be pointing to is called. When I call is called, it will print hello, it will be hello. So you see in here, function inside the function, I missed it, and I could, you know, assign a function to a function to be a different way. All right, so this is not a decorator. This is just tell you what you could do in Python. In Python, you could call, you could assign a function to function, you could, you know, uh, pass a function to a function, okay? And you could have function inside a function, function inside a function, right? Function inside a uh, function. So we could do that on all of that. There's, whenever I see like a function this way, written this way, underscore, underscore, something, underscore, underscore, that means it was created where? In the object class, in the object Class. So what if if a function if a, a class it has this function what we call it callable an object which implements the special method is called callable that means could be called so in the most basic sense a decorator is a callable that returns a callable what is a, a decorator is a callable that returns a callable. That means a function that returns a function, okay? So basically, the decorator takes in a function, adds some functionality, and returns it. Decoration, right? All right, so what is this? What is this? Pointer, right? All right, it has a function, right? Okay. So it's kind, the decorator is like, put it inside something else, but will make it a better pointer, a better pointer. So you take a function, you decorate it a little bit, and you return another function. Make sense? Example will make it more clear. So what is a decorator? Is a function that adds some functionality to and returns it, all right? Okay, so let's take an example. So, make it pretty. Make it pretty. So, there's a function called make it pretty. What are you going to pass to it? A function. So, we're going to take this function, okay, and we'll make it pretty. So, function, we modify the operation. So, okay. So, in inner, that's the inner function print, I got a decorator, get decorator. And then you call the function and return the inner, return the inner. So what you did in here, what you did, what you did is you took a function, you modified it, and you called it. All right? Ordinary, for example, ordinary print, I am ordinary. So what you did in here, when you execute ordinary, what you'll get? I am ordinary. Okay, forget about this. If there's a function called ordinary. What does it do? Print a sentence. What is the sentence? I am ordinary. I'm executing it, calling it, and print it, I am ordinary. So this is a function, simple function. Let's try to create a de decorate this function. Let's try to decorate this function. All right? What does it decorate in here? What does it mean, decorate? Add more functionality. All right, so let decorate this ordinary function. So what we did, make it pretty ordinary. So what we paste the ordinary function to another function, and we save it an object. We call it pretty. When I do pretty in here, what does it do? 
let's take a look. Pretty, okay, I'm gonna call this, right? Pretty, I'm gonna call this, okay? So what is a function in here? Pretty. Will be ordinary. Then print, I got good decorator. I got decorated. And then we'll execute the function. What is a function? I am ordinary. So printed, I am ordinary. Clear? So what we are trying to do in here, a function behaves in a certain way. We need to decorate it. What does it mean decorate? Add more functionality for it. So this decorator will call that function, will execute it somewhere, but will do some other things. Some other things. That's what we call it, decorator. What is a decorator? A function. Calling another function and adding more functionality to the original function. Can I ask a question? What is a decorator? You never took that before? No? So your friends know what decorator is now. Alright, so it's here. So let me explain it for you quickly. Okay? So the decorator is you have a function, like ordinary function. This ordinary function. What does it do? Tell me what does it do? Print. Print what? I am ordinary. I am ordinary, right? Are you? <laughs> okay. Okay. So print I am ordinary. So if I, if I call it, what does it print? I am ordinary. I am ordinary. So what is decorator? Decorator is function that call that function and modify it. So we have a created a decorator in here. So we could pass ordinary here to this function. What does it first do? Print I could decorate it, and then it calls the function. So. And here, when you, you try to execute that function, it will dec be decorated, I got decorated, and I am ordinary. So a function is called, it's calling another function to modify how it works. That's what it is. Where is this useful? When you have a, a function that you need it always, but you need it to behave differently, depends on how is it called, where is it called. Right? Or multiple functions that you want to add. Decoration to a different behavior, for example. Okay? And instead of writing like five, let's say that I have different behaviors. And all of them, they have a core part that all of them do. So I'll make it like the core part, and then I create decorators at the core part. Somebody says, why well, I need to do that? Let me create, you know, a whole complete different five. You could. But you know, some you know, you could, you could. But this way, it might, might be faster. Okay, we didn't repeat code. Okay. So, how we call it? Remember this at. So I mean, here it, 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 it's a longer way to call it. So the nice thing after you write the decorator, okay, what you need? So ordinary, and then I put in top of it, at make pretty. So that's how you call it. And make it pretty, okay? And then if this function will be called to the make pretty and will be executed. So it will be much more faster calling, okay, calling for the decorator, okay? So this code is equivalent to this code which we did in here. So now when you call ordinary, if, it, if you override, it'll, so whenever you call ordinary, it has to call the decorator. Uh -huh. It has to call the decorator. Okay. It will be will become fun when you start using them. When you see how they are useful. Decorating functions with parameters. So for example, let's take a look at this quickly at this example. So in here is smart divide a function. So let's take a look at the function first. So what does the function do? What is the function? Divide. Okay, divide. A by B will return A by B. So this is simple. Can you create a better divide program? Sure, you have to try and accept because it could be zero, right? 
All right. So this is the function. All right. To decorate it, what I added, smart device. What is this? When you see a function, it has on top of it add something. Then this is what a decorator. Let's go to the decorator. So when I buy divide, what does it do? N of A and B, print, I am going to divide A and B. If B equals zero, print, oops, cannot divide. So I use the decorator for what? To make sure I'm not dividing by zero. Okay, and return, and then return function A times B, and return N of, right? So let's take a look at the ex ex execution. If I call this function now, divide, a, divide, divide, 2 and 5. I am going to divide 2 and 4. So does the function have it? Does the function have it? No. So where this sentence came from? Uh, from the decorator. How I know it's going to call it the decorator? Because I have this line on top of the function. All right? So let me repeat. Let me repeat. You could have a simple function but you need to add some functionality to the function. Don't include the functionality inside the function, create a decorator. And add, uh, uh, add, add the name of the decorator on top of it. So whenever, whenever you call this function, the decorator will be called. The decorator will be called. Make sense? Stop me and tell me, ask me if you are, if you are confused, right? Alright, so, and you could try this, you know. Look in here, you could, uh, you could have multiple decorators. So, in here, for example, you know, what is the function is? Print a message. So, what are you doing? Print the message. Alright? In here, I created two decorators on top of it. The first one adds what? A star. And the second one adds percent. So when we call the print message, like uh, hello, and add this and this, and he understands. Okay, what does it do, right? So the order is very important. If you, so it will start from this one and then this one. If you flip them, it will start with this one and this one. Okay. So in here, when I did, for example, percent and then start, I start with the percent and then the start. When I did the start of the percent, start with the start and then that percent. So that means a function could have a function could have multiple decorators. All right. So you have a basic function. I need to add some functionality to it. I could create a decorator. I need a different kind of uh, you know functionality. Add another decorator. All right. I'm sure once you type this code, play with it, you'll understand it fully. Okay, if you are confused, just you have to play with it. Okay, you have to play with it. Okay? In a programming, does it, is it useful to have decorators? Of course. Of course. Remember when you write codes, you you're writing thousands of lines, many functions. So you don't want, you know, to you know you know write this code many times, just create the core function and call a decorator. Property. Did we use property last week? Add property. We did. We did. Remember when we spoke about setters and getters? So what do we do for setters and getters? We we'll create properties, right? So property is like a modification for a function. That's what's a property, right? How to modify that function. So an example to begin with. So let's take a look in here. Class salience. So I have to initialize the class. So I'm passing the temperature. So how many attributes I have in this class? One. Okay, temperature, temperature. And how many uh, how many methods I have? One. What does it do? Convert the temperature to Fahrenheit. So this is a class. It has one attribute and one. One attribute and one. Right. What is the attribute? Is the temperature in Celsius, and what is the method? Converting this temperature to Fahrenheit. Easy, easy. All right. So whenever we assign or retrieve any object attribute like temperature, as shown above, 
Python searches it in the dictionary the dictionary um, uh, uh, variable. All right. So on here, for example, when I say serious, I'm calling this function. I'm saving it. Create a new object, which is man. What is a man? It's an object of class serious. It has one attribute. So I could set it up. How can I set it up? Man that the pressure equal three seven. I could also read it. How can I read it? Man dot temperature will give me thirty seven. All right. I could call one method, which is man to Fahrenheit will give me the temperature. Simple. Anything you do with this slide? Anything you new? Nothing, right? I have a class that has one attribute, has one method. What did I did? What I did in here? Setting the value in here, getting the value in here, calling a method. Right. So using getters and setters, we explained that last week. The setters and getters, right? How to do them? So just a quick review in here. So class Celius. So in it, what is in it in here? The constructor. Then to Fahrenheit, what is this? A method. And then get temperature, what is this? Getter. And then set temperature, what is this? Getter. Anything new here? It's normally class. It has the constructor. It has the setter. It has the getter. Okay, using what? Methods using the methods, right? Right? Nothing new. Last week also we learned how we can convert this methods into property, right? Into property. So in here, what we did in here? Class. So, Celius. So what is this? Constructor. How many attributes it has? One. Two for nine. What is this? A, myth, a method. What does it do? Convert the temperature to very nice. Then, get temperature and set temperature. In here, what we are doing in here? Setter and getter and setter. What's the problem in here? What, what's the problem with this? Is that always you could, you know, enter room value and it, it will go through. So you could enter like a temperature in the mind unless you take care with it in the code itself, right? So you're not recording. Okay. okay. So so in here, what we did, we did a a property temperature. We call the property temperature. So the property has two elements. What are the two elements? The getter and the setter. Remember, the, the property has how many elements usually? Four. What are they? Getter, setter, deleter, and document. OK? So if you go to the, let's take a look at the property function. So what you pass to the property function? Function to get, function to set, function to delete, and the document. In this, in here, I added the first two, right? I passed the first two. What are the next two will be? What's the value of the next two will be? The default values. What are the default values? None. None, right? None. Right? All right. So if get is a function to get the value, okay? If set is a function to set the value. If del, the function to delete the attribute. And doc is a string like a comment. So when you need to call the property, very simple what I say, property. Okay? Property. And it will, uh, a function arguments are optional. Okay. So you added a property here. All right. 
So a property object has three methods, getter, setter, deleter, to specify, okay, okay. So that's what we have, like usually, set, getter and the setter. All right, so make empty property. So property, I did not pass anything. I did not pass this function or this function in temperature, right? If I say temperature, okay, tem uh, uh, assign, and here what I did, I assigned what? The getter, and in here what did I assign? The setter, so temperature dot getter equals this, and temperature dot setter equals the setter function. Again, let me go back, all right, here. In here what I have, I have a class that has one attribute, this is a constructor, it has one function, it has a getter, and it has a setter. What's the getter and setter? They are functions that I'm writing them, right? I could create a, 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 a property. The property will include what? The getter and the setter. And that's exactly what I did, what we did in here. So I created a property for the temperature. Okay, what temperature? Okay. And I assigned the getter, which is the function I wrote, and the setter, which is the function I wrote. Once I do that, once I do that, so when I create the temperature, I'll add at property added. What does it add property? What does it tell this code it is? It's what? The getter. Okay? And what you notice, what is the advantage of a getter? We spoke about it last time. That you could name the function to be the same as the attribute. So temperature, temperature, temperature. So in here, look at this now. This is the most elegant way to write the code. So you have in here, what do you have in here? The constructor, the constructor. What is this? A method to convert from CDS to 39. And then what you have in here? The getter. The name of the getter equals to the name of the attribute. But to make sure that everybody knows, the compiler knows it's a getter, you add in top of it, add property. When you go to the setter in here, it will have the same name as the attribute. Just to make sure the compiler knows it's, it's the setter, you add add temperature dot setter. What is this? Decorators, decorators and property, right? Okay. And that's the way you should write the code. That's the way you should write the code. Now, how many how many attributes I have in here? One. What's the name of this attribute? Temperature. How many setters and getters I have to have? One setter and one getter. Let's say I have two attributes. So how many setters I have? Two. How many getters? Two. Let's say I have 20 attributes. So how many setters I will have? All right? So you see how much lines you saved just, just by using the property? Okay? And how much you made the code readable. Why? Because if you have an attribute called temperature, what's the name of that setter? The attribute that temperature that setter. What's the name of the getter? No. What's the name of the setter? Temperature. What's the name of the getter? Temperature. What is the name of the attribute? Temperature. All right? If you have another attribute called abusnet, so you're going to have abusnet, abusnet, abusnet. However, think about like having like 50 attributes or 20 attributes. If you need to use the old way, the old way, you see in here the old way what you do? Get temperature get like long names and all of that. So get temperature is for temperature. So I added extra words and all of them. Why I need to all do all of that? It will become the code is a much more readable. Readable. So whenever you write a setter and a getter, you have to use? Decorators. Iterators? Decorators. Decorators. Okay? Property. In your homework, I don't want to see any more, any class, any setter, any gutter, with the old fashioned, it has to use the decorators and the property. You must know how to use it.
Okay, and it's much more elegant, much more easy. Right, much more elegant and much more easy to use. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna come to another advanced topic which is Python shallow copy and deep copy. So in shallow copy, what we are doing? A reference. Okay? Reference. So for example, if I have a list, for example, A equals one, two, three. B equals A. So in the memory, what I'm doing? I have in the memory for the list. One, two, three. So I have a pointer in here called A and a pointer here called B. So if I change a value of one of these lists, I'm changing the other. So this is what they call it, shallow copy, shallow copy. Okay, it's not a real copy, it's not a creating one. So you have to be very careful, very careful, okay, when you write the code. Remember, lists, especially they are mutable, okay? So you could modify the list from anywhere in the program. You have 2,000 lines of code. You modify it anywhere, it will be changed. And go figure, where did you change it? All right, so you have to be very careful what you are doing, right? So basically, if you need, okay, so in here, I mean, this is the example I already said, okay. So in here, when I have old list and a new list, when I modify one of the list, it will change the other one, okay? If I really need to have a deep copy, deep copy means another copy. So all I have to import copy, there is copy and there is deep copy. So copy returns a shallow copy, and deep copy returns a deep copy. What does it mean, deep copy? Create another memory location. It's like completely different. Okay? So there is a shallow copy, deep copy, especially when you deal with containers. With containers. So be careful. How you, so you could import this library to create a deep copy. Deep copy means what? Completely different copy. Saved in different place in the memory. Right? There's examples for you. Take a look at them. Then Python assert statement. This is something you should not ignore. Assert. Assert. So what assert, what does it do? Let me see if I have a yeah, assert. So for example, if you have a search condition, if it's a true, program continue to run. If it's false, assign a, a, assertion and stop the program and give assertion error. So when you're writing a code, you need to check at certain point if it's executing right, try to assert. Let's take an example. So if it's not, it will hold the program. It will hold the program as soon as the error happens. So for example, in here, for example, okay. So in here, you're calculating the average. Average of what? Of marks. So you're gonna pass the marks. What is marks in here? Supposed to be a list, right? Or a tube, right? So before you continue, assert the length of the marks is not zero. If the length of the mark is zero, zero then there is no, no average. Okay? Return sum of the marks divided by the length of the marks. Divided by the length of the marks. If you don't put this line in here, what you will have in here? Division by zero. Which is a big problem. So it'll just throw an error. Huh? It'll just throw uh, Exactly. The, the, it will give you a cert error. That's what a, a cert error. Or you could specify the language of the error. So in here, for example, you said assert, okay? And in here, I said assert, okay? You know, assert uh, the length of the marks, okay? Is that, and you could print, print the, the language after that, the language of that, okay? What you need to assert. So assert is like a sentence that you should use it a lot. Okay? Alright? Assert that you use it a lot. The question is, shall I do try exception? Try exception is like more involving. This is like also for code testing. You know, when you write a code, you, you don't know where is the problems you have to pose, the bug and all of that, you could use assert. Okay? It's a very useful tool to, look to use. Oh, zip. You know what zip? Yes. Okay. 
So for example, uh, you zip iterators. So you have like a list and a list. You need to zip them together. Okay, zip them together. It's a very useful for iterators. Okay, take iterate, iterable and use it. So zip iterables, okay? So let's take example, maybe have an example. And here for example, okay, number list one, two, three, string list one, two. If you zip them together, okay, if you zip, you, didn't, you pass nothing, so nothing will happen. In here, for example, uh, what you did, you zip the num list in here and with the string list, okay? When you print them, so the two is zipped, where is it? Uh, the two is zipped, okay. The one is zipped with one, the two with two, the three with three. So you're zipping them, right? So the one will be zipped with one, two with two, okay. All right? Again, there is not, not necessarily that position and to give you, the, give them two in the order. Okay? Sorry? Right? Yes. What is the result before we convert it to set? Is it a list or? Uh, it's uh, an object of zip. We, we cannot print it. Uh, in here, I mean, you know, a list, the result, okay, is an object of zip. So if you type print, ty print type result, it will give you object. So you have to convert it either to list or the set or whatever to be able to see it. All right. There's more examples. Take a look. More details. It's up to you. I don't have time. Okay. There is map. Map is a very useful tool. What does it map to do? Okay. Map function applies a given function to each item in the item. So, for example, okay, in here, you have, okay, this is a function. What does this function do? Calculate the square. So, if you pass two, it will give you four. Three will give you nine. So now I have a I have a set. Okay? One, two, three, four. So map, what is in here? A function. A function. What is in here? A set. So we'll apply the function to each element of the set. That will give you a list which is sixteen, what whatever. A set, whatever, sixteen, one, four, five. Okay? So this map, is you map, you map a function to to what? Sense. Or a list. Tuple. Or a tuple. Tuple. Iterable. Okay. Something iterable. Okay. Something iterable. Okay. If you have a class, for example, of boxes, boxes, and you made it iterable, you know how to make it iterable? By creating an iter and next function. You could pass it here. So any iterable. It could be a string, it could be a list, it could be a set, it could be a dictionary. Any iterable or anything, any class you created, but you made it iterable. You could map. Map what? A function to elements of that iterable. To that iterable. By the way, iterables, understanding iterables, how you create a, a class iterable, is a very important thing. Because once you make a class iterable, a simple, a simple function like map, it would be very useful. Very useful, okay, useful. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a class called box. What is a box? Right, a box, right? Right? So if I have like multiple boxes and I need to print, for example, the volume of the box. So let's say that the volume of the box and you 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 pass like iterable boxes. So in one line you'll be able to pass. So it's a very important to understand how to make, if you can, you know, the iterable boxes. Okay, the last thing we're gonna cover today is multi-threading, and this is very important in many applications. So what is multi-threading? What is a thread? It's like multiple, it's like concurrent functions running at the same time in one process. 
So that is a multiple processing. So you could, for example, have multiple processes. Okay. You could have in the system for process one, process two, each process, process three, as an ID. You could have, and in the same process, you have thread one, thread two, thread three. So you could have three pieces of the code, three different pieces of the code, run at the same time. So it's like concurrent execution. Concurrent execution. All right? In IoT class, I remember they taking IoT class. Okay, good too. Yeah. How you like the IoT class so far? Good. Good. Okay. So in IoT class, for example, we're reading data from sensors. So sensor one, for example, sensor two, sensor three, let's say. Right? And the code is not running sequential, running in parallel. So continually reading from sensor one, continue reading from sensor two, continue reading from sensor three. So I could create three threads in the process to read the three sensors and display them at the same time. So multi-threading is a very important. Another function for multi-threading, if you have a big task, a big task, okay, like reading data from the database and saving it to a list in the in the in the computer. So the one, third one is to read the data from the database. Thread two is to create the list or more added add it to the list. Thirty three to do the sort. So what you are doing like doing things in power. Doing things in the power, right? So multi threading is a very important thing. Of course it will make the execution of things faster. So what we do, running several threads is similar to running several different programs concurrently, but with the following benefits. Number one, multiple threads within a process share the same data space. So it's when a process and, and the threads share all the data space with the main thread and can therefore share information or communicate with each other more easily than if, if they were separate processes. If they are separate processes, what do you have to do? Socket programming, for example. So it's a whole issue. You have to create a socket to communicate between the two processes. Now we have one process and you're running, and they are sharing the data, right? Sharing the data, sharing the data space. Two, threads are sometimes called lightweight processes and they do not require much memory overhead. They are cheaper than process. Okay. Oh, a thread has beginning, so the thread has a beginning. Execution sequence, so it's a code. It's like a code, right? Thread is a program. So inside the program, when does it start? That's the beginning. Then what it has to execute, this thread, that's a sequence of instructions. And then ending. The conclusion. Okay? Okay. The, it could be preempted, it could be interrupted, okay? And it can temporarily be put on hold, okay? Also known as leaving or yielding. So you could do that with a thread, right? So a thread, again, what's a thread? It's a program that runs inside a program. It has a start, it has a sequence, it has an end. You could, you could interrupt it, and you could hold it. You could hold it, right? Pause. So there's two different types of threads. There's kernel threads, let's not worry about it, and user threads that you could write inside your program. All right. Okay, Python wise, talking Python now. So to create the threads, there's a module for you, given to you. What's the name of the module? Threading. Okay, threading. So you have to import the threading module, like anywhere else, like anything we did. What we will do first, import the module. What's the name of the module? Threading. Okay, threading that, so there's many functions. Some of them I listed for you. Threading that active count. So returns the number of thread objects that are active. Could have five, 10, 20, okay? 
threading current thread returns the number of thread objects in the caller's thread controller. And, you know, you could list the, the threads. All right. Now, when you import the threading, what is a threading? A module. What does module have? Classes. We need to import one class, which is thread. So we import thread the class from threading module. Fair? Now, what does the class have? And methods. What are methods? Functions. Which function are we going to use? The run. Actually, the start, which calls the run. Join is alive. We'd like to know if the thread is alive. Okay, get name. What's the name of the thread? Set name, set the name method, set the name of the thread. So the thread usually it could have, I'm mean, gonna give it a name to identify it, ID or something. So it could have this thing. So to start will call run, okay, which will start the, the thread. Okay, so what are these methods? And a thread class which is imported from threading module, which is imported from, uh, inherited from object, you know, thread from object, right? And all right. So creating a threading using a threading module. To implement a new thread using the threading module, you have to do the following. You have to define a subclass you have to override the init, and you have to override the run. And then you call it by start. Simple, okay? Let's go to the code, I think you have a code, good. Can you see? Can you see? I can't see myself, I can't see. <laughs> so, import threading, what is the threading? Who said the clause? The module. Okay. Import time. Okay. So exit flag zero. We'll talk about it later. So now, to create a thread, a thread is what? A class inherited from where? Thread a class. So I'm creating my, my own thread from inherited from a thread, which is part of threading module. Cool so far. Cool, right? Now. Each class, it has what? A constructor, all right? So I'm creating here a constructor. It has three attributes. The first one is the thread ID, fair? If I have many threads, I have to give it an ID, right? Then name, I could give it a name. Then the counter, the counter. We'll talk about the counter in a second. Okay, counter, yeah, okay, we'll talk about it. okay. All right, so this is, what is this? It's my own constructor. But also I have to inherit the constructor from the thread. So all I have to call threading thread, and I call, uh, I call the constructor from the original class. So this is my own constructor. This is a constructor called from here. Simple, we did that before, right? All right, now what I have to do next, initialize the attributes. So Thread ID, thread ID, name, name, counter, counter. Okay? So I said we have to override how many, how many methods? Two. What is the first one? Constructor. We should did. We override the constructor. So we override, right? What's the second one? The run. The run. Okay? Run. So run self, okay? So what I did, the print, starting the name, okay? Then print time, what is the print time? A method, which again define, gonna call, and then a print existing the module, all right? All right, okay. I have one method inside this, one method inside the, the class, which is a print time. So whenever I create, whenever I create a thread, I need to know <laughs> what time I have created it. This simple. Okay? In your application, this thread could do sorting, 
could do many things, right? In our application here, just to show it, what does it do? Show the time when it was created. So what we're going to pass to it, OK, thread name, thread name, and delay, so every two seconds, and the counter, how many threads, OK? While counter, OK, if exit flag, OK, you know, one is not zero, thread name, and exit. So if it's zero, exit. Otherwise, sleep, the delay, which is in here, delay sleep. And then what you do, you print the thread name, time, OK, and the counter minus one. So if, if, if I need to call it five times, five, four, four, until it goes to zero. All right. So in here, what I'm doing in here, create, so this is, what is this all of the above? What is it? A class of a thread that I have created. A class of a thread that I have created. What does it do? What does it do? Whenever I create a thread, it just prints the time. So in here what I'm doing, I'm, I'm calling my thread, thread one. So one is the ID, I'm calling a thread one, and one is the delay time, the delay between each thread, right? Okay, in here, Thread two, okay. ID two, call three two and two. Now I created the objects of the threads. Now, how can I call them? Start. So thread one that start, it will start. Thread two that start will start. Okay. Now I'm using join. What is the join for? To wait until, I mean, I'm, like how many threads in this program now? How many threads I have? Three. Right? What is the first one? The main program. The second one, thread one, thread two. So in here, what I'm saying in here, don't go to the main program until thread one and thread two finishes. Until they join the main program. Right? So which one gonna okay, where is it starting with the execution? It starts from here. So in here what I'm doing? Creating thread one. Thread one, when you create it, what does it do? Call what? The constructor. The constructor, what does it do? Right? Right? Then, um, then after that, what I'm doing, I'm creating thread two. What does it do? Call the constructor. Then what I'm executing after that? Start. What start does? Call the Run, where is the run? The run, so it's called the run. Now, the run, what does it do? Run time. Print time, it calls a method called print time, right? Now, thread one and thread two, they are working sequentially or in parallel? Uh, They're in parallel. They're in parallel. So, who will schedule the whole process? The, the, the kernel, right? All right. So every time you execute it, will give you different results. Every time you execute it, will give you different uh, results. For example, in here, starting thread one, started thread two, then thread one, two, one, one, two, one, one, one. Okay, because they're running in the parallel. Why, 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 you know, uh, it didn't come in order because they're running in the power and also the delay for each one of them is different. One we made it one second, the other one is two seconds. Okay? You could play with it, right? Okay. Let's try to run it. So you see in here, thread one, thread two, okay? All right, so every time we run it will be different. So let me go on the code for example, okay?
okay? And so the delay So when I create a thread, one the delay in here one second, right? So let me make it like in here, like ten seconds. Okay. So thread one is like between each running and ten seconds. What do you notice in here? Thread two will finish before because the delay for the thread two is two seconds. Okay. Now thread one came. Right. Okay, and then existing the, the so who execute existing thread two? And then did it finish? finished you see it existing thread one existing main thread why the main thread skewed at the end because we asked to join so after thread one and two finished then the main was okay join so, just means joining it to the main to the main okay. join main to the main okay all right so basically well, that's what's in thread. i don't want to go on deep just you have to play with it try with it i i, I created like a couple more examples for you to enjoy Okay, take a look at them. Okay, in here. Just cut and paste, and, and then also you could synchronize threads. Just take a look at this, I don't have time to cover that. Something you will not cover a lot in here is packaging, right? So let's say that you work in this, first of all, you know, uh, you know, let's say that you're working in this project, like a big project, like classes and all of that, all right? You could create a module out of it and share it with everybody, right? So how can you package all your files together? Right? So there is a tool for that. Uh, you could play with it. Just I want just want you to be aware. First of all, we know how uh, how we import modules. Like there is modules, you pip it, it's in your system, right? And then you import it, or you import the classes from it. If you import the module, that means you imported all the classes from that module. Is that healthy to do? Might not, because if the module is so big, you're importing a lot of code that you don't use. So the best thing is to, to import a class from a module. Okay, right? Because that's a class that you need, right? Now, you created your own module, your classes. You like create like 20 classes, and you need all of them to package them to create one module. So you could share it with the people, give it to the people. It's like all the product. You have a product. So you have to do what? A package. You have to do a package, right? Okay. Then after that, you could upload it to, you know, somewhere. You could pip and install it. It's your product, right? It becomes like a module. So there is, um, you, you know, there are different uh, utilities to do that. One of them is... Um, so the package, package is collection of modules. Package is a collection of modules. There are various tools which can then convert uh, the directory into a special format, also called package. So a bunch of modules, you need to create a package that you need to, so, so the package used to install the code cleanly on your computer or other people's computers, okay? So, so there is this utility that's called distribute, distribute, and from uh, setup tools, import the setup. So you need to create your directory like this. So let's say that you, our project, this is a project, you create another folder called our project, and then you put all the Python files inside it, all right? And you get a put in it, that by keep it empty. But in the main file in our project, again, I put setup.py, setup.py, right? And the content of setup.py setup is the following. So setup, the name, whatever the name you're going to give to the 
to the package version. You're gonna get given the version, right? Like for example, NumPy module. It has a version, right? Every time version, right? It's like like a package, right? Description, what it is. If you have the URL for it, author, who is the author, <coughs> uh, author email, license, general purpose license, general purpose license, packages, okay, and zip safe, false, whatever, okay. So, so you, where, where does where this code goes inside the setup Python? All right, setup Python, right? And this information, your own information. You're gonna put your email, and whatever, okay, and then. You run the setup Python. So all you have to run, okay, Python three setup the Python install, and that will create what the package for you. So the package you could put it in a CD, you could share it in the web, you could put it anywhere, okay, and you know uh, you could send it, you know, like any any package you download from the internet to install pip install for this the same thing pip install. So you could combine all of these. Together, right? Last thing, last thing about the box strings. Okay, so notice in here at the beginning of the program, there is a box string, right? You could put, uh, and box string goes into triple quotes, right? Triple quotes, right? So quote, 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 right? So for this module, uh, for our person class, whatever, also always up. So at the beginning of the program, always create a box string. That's a very good habit. The first line is after the class, defining class, put a duck string. Explain what is a class for, okay? The first line is after any function, put a duck string. So a duck string for the function, for the class, and for the program, for the file, the whole file, all of that. It's a good habit always to do, do that. And it's fixed. All right. So uh, I think we covered a lot of things uh, today. Uh, all of them need some training, some work. Uh, for now, I could say thank you so much.